Hello, bird nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This is Monday with Holly. But you got that right. Monday with Holly oh. without Holly. Because Holly has been super, super, super busy uh, in the bird life world. Who would have known that someone working for bird life would be busy? Hey? And not just sitting around waiting for some dude to say, get on the show. So... <clears throat> It's a cast of thousands today. Um, let's uh, let's see if I can do this right. Let's start with um, the the two up in up in the top corner next to me, Jess McLaughlin. Hi, Jess. You better unmute yourself. Yeah, Jess. sorry. I have I have two dogs who decided as soon as you started the countdown to share their opinions. Well, so. they're more than they're more than welcome. <laughs> now, now, Jess, you're at um, UC Berkeley. Tell us mm -hmm. uh, briefly what you do and briefly tell us about Bird Names for Birds. Yeah, so my day job is as an evolutionary biologist. Um, I currently actually work on lizards here, but all my training's been as an ornithologist up until this point. But um, I'm actually here with uh, wearing one of my other hats today, which is as the uh, one of the leads for historical biographies of the Bird Names for Birds project. Um, we are, uh, uh, we're more based in the US, although one of our members is, we also have some uh, folks involved in the UK as well, but um, we're uh, drawing attention to uh, eponymous names for birds, birds that are named after people and why that that is kind of inherently a problematic way to name birds and that they should have names that are about the birds and not about us people um so yeah that's kind of so that's uh, uh mainly what i'm going to be talking about today cool and um a newcomer to the show down uh if, if do the brady bunch we've got <laughs> uh, uh nick nicholas nick bishop <laughs> Hi, Nick. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, thank you. And hello, everybody out there in listener land and looking land. This is an amazing platform to be on. This is fantastic to join you today. And I work currently as the Animal Behaviour and Creative Programs Manager for Zoo South Australia, which means I look after science of behaviour and also art of story sharing. My background is all in ornithology and my major career focus has been on the training of birds for free flight shows using the power of positive reinforcement in order to engage really vivid nature narratives for people. I'm also a passionate birder, uh, bird nerd, have birded extensively with my mate, Ricky Bird, there just uh, next door to me. So I'm uh, looking so forward to sharing with you today and getting some incredible geekery on. Now, Nick, help, <laughs> help me out. Um, Ricky and I couldn't... Um uh agree uh, 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 resolve this point are you chad's boss yes all oh, right so uh, now if you aren't a regular watcher or listener of the show uh chad is chad criddle who works as a i think the senior keeper i think is his is his title uh with zoos sa adelaide zoo monado safari park and we did a lovely uh episode about the free flight shows and whatnot that Chad's involved in. So um, uh, there we go. It's great. We've got you in the family. And it's really nice that someone from a zoo wants to get involved because it's pretty hard to get someone to come on from a zoo onto the well, show. Well, my interests are so diverse. You know, I do regular radio on on bird scenes here around Adelaide. And at the moment, I'm tracking black swans in their signets just north of us here and reporting in on that. But also, as far as Chad is concerned, I'm one of his bosses. I look after like behavior, behavior and, and narrative stuff. And so I confer with him on that. He's got another boss again. Uh, so but he's so, so brilliant and so fun. And he's got so much initiative and drive that I wouldn't be surprised if soon he's my boss. Well, that, I, I, I really encourage people to listen or watch that episode. Uh, I think it's, I think it's at thebirdemergency dot com slash chad. That's really hard, um, and you can you can check out his history and uh, and his experience. I think thousands and thousands of 
free flight shows he's done. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's great. And Ricky, welcome back to the agency. Ricky from Aussie Wild. And if you're a regular, you'll know that Ricky has recently begun a bird watching course, which we talked about. But Ricky's a um, well known bird guide. Ricky, brief, uh, brief summary of the CV. <laughs> Oh, hi, Grant, and thanks, um, thanks Jess and Nick, for being here, and uh, thanks for all the, the watchers and listeners out there for joining us too. Um, well, I guess um, like everyone here, I've always been a lot about birds, and um, I've sort of made that a great deal of my life. Uh, I guess um, I go back to guiding in the uh, from about the mid to late 90s on uh, in the forests of uh, the Sydney region and uh, later on became warden at Broom Bird Observatory and have worked at um, uh, as an avian consultant for a lot of uh, local uh, government and various um, you know, industry bodies uh, and uh, yeah engage a lot with shorebirds but also with bushbirds and I have a, a, a little gig called Aussie Wild where I run uh, different kinds of courses and workshops for birders as well as uh, bird touring as well. So bird nerds all around. I'm surrounded by experts. So that's the way <laughs> I like it on this, on this show. I, of course, am a bird nerd and my only claim to any uh, scientific validity is that I am a horticulturist uh, by training but uh, bird nerd by passion. So let's kick off with the first sort of issue I wanted to raise, and that is how how does a bird get named? And then what's the right name? And tied into that, why do they change? So who, who wants to have first stab at that little morsel? I reckon that's you, Nick. <clears throat> well, of course, when we're talking about bird names, we're initially going off of an original impression. And there are so many bird names that have their origin in other languages as well. For instance, let's take penguin. Penguin is a charming sounding word. But it's from the Latin penguis, which actually means a fatty, a fat bird. <laughs> and it's interesting that when the great orc was still around in the 19th century, it was also known as penguin. And indeed, the term penguin was actually coined for orcs first and then became applied to the penguins of the southern hemisphere when they were discovered. And it became their name. So there was a naming takeover there from those Sveniskids of the Southern Hemisphere. But what I think is really interesting to consider is that many birds in Australia got their names as combinations as well. So established bird names like magpies, thrushes, shrikes, tits, all of those were already in the ornithological lexicon for those here in Australia and pining for the mother country. And let's face it, many colonialists, many settlists had decided that Australia's bird life was definitely orally depauperate compared to that of the mother country. And so there became these glorious combinations of bird names which stick to this day, which I actually really like, such as crested shrike tit. Yes. Looks a bit like a shrike, behaves a bit like a tit. I know what we'll do. We're going to call it a shrike tit. What's that one over there? It's a bit like a shrike, but it also moves like a thrush. But we call it a shrike thrush. And so it goes. So there's great. it's great the way in which there can be hyphenated bird names as well. You can't actually decide exactly what it is. But so many of the, the world's bird names come from the languages of regions and the languages of Greek and Latin, which, as far as I'm concerned, Latin particularly is not a defunct language if we're still using it in the scientific nomenclature. And for me, the really important thing to do is also zero in on what those scientific names mean. And thinking about Linnaeus, who was an order obsessive, 
he just really wanted taxonomy to reflect accurately an appropriate set of divisions. And interesting to consider, he had a mate called Peter Artredi, who was a fish taxonomist and a brilliant young man who unfortunately drowned in a canal in Amsterdam on his way home from a drinking party one night, but left this system that Linnaeus actually adopted into his own thinking. And uh, it uh, was uh, this is, genus and is, species element that they came up with that really means so much to us today when it comes to defining a bird as a unit of discrete evolutionary lineage. Nick, sorry to interrupt there, but when when you said borrowed, I had to wonder whether the correct word is stolen because <laughs> I I studied... Linnaeus, old mate Carl, and I'd never heard of anyone else coming up with uh, uh, with binomial uh, system and applying mm. Latin names. So you're probably yeah, being interesting. very kind, aren't you, to, to well, say borrowed? It, it, they were great mates, Artredi and, and, and Linnaeus, but it's rather, it's not dissimilar. It, it's, just, you know, we know that Charles Darwin had an epigon in Huxley. And doing some research into Linnaeus's life, it seems that Artredi may have been his epigon as well. And indeed, you can say that Wallace was Darwin's uh, strongly organised thinking uh, prompt for the amazing uh, origin of species. In fact, it was his 20 pages that he screed off in a tropical fever that prompted Darwin when he received it. You can imagine when he received it at Down House in Kent, how he just cracked it. And it took Charles Lyell and Joseph Hooker, the geologist and the botanist, to actually say, calm the farm, mate, just take a chill. Uh, Charlie, we need to uh, just think about how we do this. And they co-released Origin of Species. But because Darwin, courtesy of the Voyage of the Beagle, had all of the Victoria notoriety, it was really him that got mostly credited with that. Uh, but Wallace made a substantial um, contribution that I hold in equal regard to Darwin. So yes, that's interesting. Did he borrow? Did he steal? There's a few arguments going on about that in science even today, that is for sure. And, and of course, I'm judging by today's standards, whereas at the time, the system of patronage so you would have the diligent worker out there doing all the work and ah. submitting all the information to uh, uh, to the fat bastard in London or in <laughs> Surrey or in Kent, um, uh, in in their conservatory or their library, and then they yep. become the name. They're, they're funding the operations, and then they become the name that we are synonymous with. It's a bit like. Um, uh, it's a bit like Banks uh, in in the plant world. Um, yes, he he wasn't out there collecting all of the all of the plants that we know uh, that that he described. But it's someone like Hooker who was out there, or someone like Crazy Ludwig Ludwig Leichhardt, um, who was collecting stuff on his expeditions and then sending them back. And we can refer yes. to John Gilbert. And of course, Jess is going to be. Uh, countless examples uh, in in North America of of this happening as well. But yeah, and yeah, can I actually piggyback off that point a little bit sure. to kind of go into the so um, kind of when the other aspect then of like, well, how do birds get names? Is then so Nick did a really good job of like laying out the kind of the baseline of like, you know, this is where you know, kind of the some of these broader names come from, but in terms of like, okay, why is this the name that is written in the guidebook for this specific thing? Um, that's a much like, that's a kind of, that's a more specific question. Well, and let, 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 let's talk about the process first. Yeah. That might help us get to why, why it happens. And then that issue of revisions. Now, yeah. I'll, I'll preface it by saying, as I understand it, because I studied this in relation to plants, is that you have to have a specimen, which is called the type specimen, 
that gets submitted to somewhere, right? The, the, the knowledgeable people, and in most cases, that was the Royal Society, in my understanding. And that for plants, it's a press specimen that is described by its appearance generally um, or its structure, if we go in the structure of the flower or something. But the first person who sticks the sticker on it and uh, ascribes the two Latin names, the genus and the species, and if they've gone into it any further, they might have assigned to existing families. But that's generally the the, the job of the fat bastard like uh, uh, Gould or uh, or, or um, uh, what's his name Darwin <laughs> sitting there in in, in England um, having presentations for his Royal Society friends or or maybe someone in the back room of the uh, of the Royal Museum. The first person to do it gets gets the honour of of having the name. Have I got that broadly right in the understanding of of each of you? Yeah, um, you know, we do. We also have bird type specimens. Um, they tend to be prepped study skins in museums. My background is actually as a museum ornithologist, so like I've seen a couple. Um, uh, I, I've been able to see a couple of types, which is always just very cool. Um, but, and then yes, like the initial description, um, uh, is written up. And then, um, of course, one of the things that happened a lot, particularly in days when communication was a lot slower, um, a lot of times somebody mm -hmm. would get a bird and not realize that somebody else had already named it. And so they think they've described something new and they give it its own binomial. And so early on, it became pretty clear that, well, in addition to just like establishing this, you know, in the Royal Society or, um, you know, any of the or the Linnaean Society, any of these, you know, uh, single institutions that there need to be some people who were going through all of this and keeping track of which names were used first, who had priority and so nowadays there's, um, you know, the whole international um, uh, zoological nomenclature uh, committee, which I think I've got the letters in the wrong order, but it's like, uh, I, I'm talking to you from your yesterday. So I'm, I don't know uh, what order words go in anymore, but um, the, uh, so, you know, these are the folks that do that nitty gritty of keeping track of like, okay, this is this name was used first, so it's the one we use instead of this one. And um, they also keep track of things like if we get more evidence um, that, for instance, well, this thing we thought was one species is actually two species. You know, they're the ones that get that review that and then like establish like, OK, yes, this is the new name to use for this group and not this group. But, and but, the, the, but there's two issues there, though, isn't there, Jess? Is that there's one? Well, there's, that is there's a couple that. Yeah, there's the precedence issue, so that mm -hmm. back in those days, remember that that um, the collector in the field has collected it. Maybe it's a three month trek to the port at uh, you know Port Port Botany and Port <laughs> Port Jackson. They've they've bundled up all their discoveries and they've then sent them on a six month journey to uh, to mm -hmm. London. Where, or to New York or wherever it may have been. And then the news comes that somebody's done it first, uh, earlier. We got something a week earlier. And then it's another six-month trek back to the collector who would be out in the bush and they don't come in and collect their mail for another four months. So it might be a year before they know that it's, they didn't actually get well the honour of being first. Well, so and that, then sometimes also what would happen, one of the things that happened to Wallace when he was collecting in South America was, you know, he wrote up all these notes about these new varieties of like monkeys and birds and butterflies and he put them all on a ship to head back to um, England. <laughs> the ship caught fire. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so like we have these descriptions, but we didn't have the type specimens that went with them. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's exactly the sort of thing that those folks over there are folks that that's just what they do. Yeah. So, 
so the the, the first thing it, tell tell me if I've, if I've got this wrong it's actually the time that it's received by the recognized body that gives precedent and that name by that body would be then adopted and and that sort of everybody generally agrees but is that what what happened didn't we didn't we have the royal society would think no we're not going to listen to what they say in boston or in new york we're the preeminent authority how does anyone know the genesis of how we went from that colonial um, concentration of scientific um, authority to a more global or um, probably more correct to say pan-Atlantic um, sharing of authority? Has anyone, anyone I mean, I got think a, a view on that? <laughs> Yeah, from from all the digging I've done, like you see, you see this process of like there, um, there's kind of all throughout the um, uh, 18th and 19th century tracking with colonialism. There's, um, you know, there's scientific, uh, there's scientific societies, and then later on ornithological societies specifically that sprout up in each of like the major colonial powers. Um, and it's just, it's kind of one of those things of like, there's a turf war over, well, you know, these are birds that we've gotten in the French colonies. How, why would we ever let the English describe these? So you end up with that and then you, you know, there's the German and the Russian and the, you know, and then the U S is like, well, but we're not going to do the same thing anymore as y'all. So, you know, we're going to do it. And then we can't even agree. So we've got Philadelphia and New York and, um, you know, multiple societies. So, and there's actually still like remnants of this around today. Like there are multiple ornithological societies. They each maintain their own checklists and um, often use different names. If you look at the International Ornithology Con Ornithological Congress checklist of birds, they recognize different, slightly different species. They use different names. Um, than we would have for the North American Checklist Committee or, you know, any other country. The And that actually gets, that also touches on another thing, which is that all of the, um, we've at least kind of for the most part agreed on if we're, if we're going to use a binomial name that we, we have to have one standardized list of those. <laughs> um, but um, the, um, the group that has the authority and like the job to keep track of all that and figure out these matters of precedence and whatever, they don't care about the common names. So the common names actually go back to the individual ornithological societies. And actually in a lot of taxa, they don't necessarily maintain a like official list. It's just what gets used in the literature is accepted as the common name. So birds are kind of weird in that, that we have like official common names. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where, um, uh, that's where like common names are where, uh, bird names for birds is focused just because it's a lot easier to change than the binomial names. Um, cause the binomial names have like this very set system based on precedence and stuff. And like, you have to really be a taxonomist to really make a change in that area. And none of us currently are, and it's a lot easier to change. And also it's kind of more impactful to change the name set you know, your average birder is going to be using in the field. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I mean, one of the interesting things in all of this is not just what's in a bird name, but which name for a given bird are you using? Because they, they got multiple. That's right. Yeah. The, 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 the threads in this issue um, come out everywhere. Now, one of the reasons this was front of mind for me and when he sort of um, <clears throat> questioned me on, on Twitter about the – what yellow winged honey eater? And I thought, I uh, one of the episodes I'd only just released, which was for the the New Zealand dotterel, we couldn't. Uh, there wasn't a consistent name even in New Zealand that was being used for an endemic bird there. And the the museum and some of the the bird groups and some of the people studying it had a different name than was being used 
uh, and in fact, they hadn't actually decided whether it was two two subspecies or just one species, and it was to the name that was being applied by the U, uh, IUCN, which is the name I chose to use because it suited suited the narrative I wanted to tell in in the episode. But it just goes to show that, well, I think I sent this out to, to you guys. Who's the boss of bird names, right? <laughs> there isn't one, is there? No, no. Uh, well, no, it's kind of confusing because if you go through field guides, even in Australia, you can find the um, Australian kestrel, the Nankeen kestrel, um, and we've, we've got a number of birds that fall into this category. A lot of it comes down to species concepts as well. And so we still have the crested shrike tip, but we also have the northern shrike tip, the eastern shrike tip, the western shrike tip. Um, and, yeah, we, this, this, of course, does also go back. I'm very confused about the yellow-tailed black cockatoo, whether it's Clipterhynchus or um, Xander, but um, that seems to be in a state of flux depending uh, where you go. But, yeah, in the common names, uh, yeah, that there's a lot of, um, I, I think, confusion out there or, or disagreements on exactly what we're going to name it, and that can be built around those species concepts. And so yeah. what, what is a species, what is a subspecies, or when is a subspecies a species, what makes a species? And, uh, of course, we have our different concepts with that, and it's an area, because I love. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's a contentious issue. So, in other words, it's splitters and your lumpers. Well, let me just um, jump in there too. Um, hello, hello on Twitch. If anyone's got a question or a comment or something that you would like to raise, um, just go ahead and stick it in the comments, and we'll um, uh, we'll get to it. Now, that that is issue of splitters and lumpers is um, goes back to that. How are we naming birds uh, officially using? Uh, the 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 borrowed or stolen Linnaeus system, which is applied to all taxa across all kingdoms and whatnot. So that's one issue, and we'll get to in a minute or in a little while about how they're being revised and why they're being revised and why change happens. But let let's explore the idea about a common name. I mean, in a continent as big as North America, and 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 in a landmass as big as Australia, with hundreds of indigenous uh, language groups, and if you talk about uh, even colonial history in Australia, South Australia, Western Australia, Sydney, <coughs> Melbourne. Darwin were all colonised in such different ways that uh, until recently they were distinct cultural entities and probably common names in the in the Anglo community were not even shared generally. But mm. how is this idea that that people have landed here? And that the indigenous people from Tipperborough have just been waiting for some white dude to come and say, "Here, that bird there, <laughs> that, yeah. that, that's a sulphur crested cockatoo." And uh, and of course, we've got our colonial mindset that we're we're saying they're very thankful for that. <laughs> how is it that that people did not? How, how how do you think it is that so many of the bird the bird names that must have been being applied to the people who have been walking that patch of ground for thousands of years in any lang language group anywhere around that so few of them are in common usage today and that well that's this this goes back to whatever is the predominating colonial society for for instance the term barbarian 
comes from the Greek bar bar, I don't understand you. And so Romans were the creators of the world and of the language and of the culture and all of the artifices that come along with that. And uh, later on, the British arrived in Australia and we this island had, well, it was terra nullius really, but, it, yep. but there were savages living here who needed to be tamed. And, of course, we discovered everything very kindly for them and uh, even though, um, you know, if we were to imagine that they've been here, well, for 65,000 years at least, that it will be around about the year 68,000 and something when we've been living here for as long as they were. So <laughs> we've, <laughs> which makes the mind boggle. Um, but we, um, yeah, we come in here and we presume that we've discovered we give our places to to mountains, to, to rivers, to, to all of the, the geography as well as all of the, 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 the birds and animals and everything else in, on, in the land. And we impose that on them, whereas, yeah, um, I, I guess there's some difficulty because we have, like, um, locally uh, the superb lyrebird is also known as we're at Jiribin and elsewhere this bird has other names. Um, where at Jurabin also gives uh, their name to the seasons as well. So we're in we're at Jurabin Tagigunyama. So the, the, here in Sydney, which is the month when the fish are running in the, the rivers, the golden wattles are blooming, the autumn west, uh, sorry, the winter westerlies are blowing in, and the um, superb lyrebird is singing. It's an interesting Jiribin. point. Oh. Uh, sorry, sorry, Nick. Oh. I'll just ask Jess to, because she's the odd the odd one out, not being from our our landmass. Uh, I I know the Towie, right? I think have I pronounced that right? Towie, Towie, that's I think the only indigenous bird name that I can think of for North America. Are there are there others that are in common usage? Um, not in like the sense of like, you know, this is what will be written in the field guide, um, for the most part. Um, uh, the only one that comes to mind that's like pretty widely used is, um, the name Whiskey Jack for, uh, Canada J, um, which does come from an indigenous, uh, word, um, and but that's and when they were renaming uh when they were uh renaming it from the gray jay a few years ago that was there was a pretty vocal uh group that were like we should we should call it this it's what many people colloquially call it um um where it lives and it's you know it's i i don't remember exactly which language uh group it comes from off the top of my head um but you know this would be appropriate but for some reason, Canada J won out. Um, I know that one of the things that we've been mindful of that some of the some of our uh, some of the indigenous folks we've been talking to here uh, have brought up. While there are some, uh, like it definitely varies strongly by uh, which you know uh, nation you talk to. Some of them. You know, some of them do regard some of that knowledge in terms of uh, their language and names because so much has been taken from them. They don't necessarily want to share it like, oh, you're going to take the one thing we have left, uh, which is one thing we've been really mindful of. I, I do think it's really awesome one that I, I I actually did my undergrad and my master's in Alaska. And one of the things that I did get to see and experience up there was a lot of the work on um revitalizing and supporting um the indigenous languages up there particularly yupik and inupiaq and um uh clinket and some of these uh other languages and getting to learn you know about the names of birds in those languages was really great because they also they i mean you already kind of uh have like got to this like it's there's there's so much extra information packed into a lot of them like the fox sparrow is uh one of the names um uh used on saint lawrence island translates to the the one that kicks dirt and if you go watch them in the forest like that's that's 100 percent what that a perfect name for that bird um so yeah so that's one thing we've we've had 
yeah. I, I want to jump on you there for a sec, Jess, just before I come back to you, Nick. See, so even yeah. saying Fox Sparrow and, yeah. and, and giving a translation, well, if the local language group, the, the local indigenous group called it the Fox something, should we even be calling it a Fox Sparrow? We can categorize it with those groups in the, uh, in the scientific nomen nomenclature, but if we're trying to move away from the sort of colonial name, what, why don't we just use the Inuit word or what, what, whatever it is? That's the point that I yeah. come back to. I, that idea maybe we as white fellas, um, being non gender specific here, but here we are, four, four white fellas. Um, I always wonder whether there are words in the Australian language group or in any other language group around the world that I regularly utter when I'm talking about birds that might be forbidden or offensive and we don't even know it. So are you aware of anything like that that's cropped up? And maybe, Nick, do you, do you know of any any words that are really wrong that are so common and so often used, but with, that we really shouldn't be saying, or that we've bastardised to a point they no longer connect with their indigenous roots. Like I'm not even sure cockatoo is uh, or kookaburra are accurate. Well, kookaburra is one of those names that is one of the few Aboriginal names that persists. And the etymology of that is on a matapeic. It's originally thought, like so many Aboriginal names are, when you spend some time with uh, Aboriginal language groups, as I have, particularly in Central Australia, when I was working at Alice Springs Desert Park, you get to know that there is a bunch of, of fabulous Aboriginal names for local birds, and many of them are based on sounds. My favourite bird in the world is the Eurasian hoopoe, and hoopoe is definitely an onomatopoeic uh, yeah, name. <laughs> when you see them, I've seen them in Africa and the Middle East, and that is exactly the sound that they make. They also have a charming a scientific name, Upupa Epops, which I think is so groovy. Yeah, it's a ripper, isn't it? Yeah. So, but uh, the the original kookaburra was something like Google Gaga. Like it was something that was just, it was sounded, then it got written down by English ears. And I think one of the most fascinating ones is Budrika. That would be, I think, the most famous Australian bird name of Aboriginal origin. And interestingly, um, Budrigar is the, the English spelling, but the originally it sounds more like a bechiriga, and it meant good food, good tucker, good to eat. <laughs> um, you'd have to get a lot of them together on breeding season, rifle through those nesting hollows to get enough budgerigars to put on the cinders to actually get a little bit of an entree going. Uh, but they were really regarded as good food. Uh, but then also what sprung up around them was a range of colonial names, and, and Ricky would know this too, like shell parakeet or shell parrot. And I recently saw bush budgies, as we also call them, in a bird shop named shell parakeets because the proprietors were trying to give them a bit of a special edge. It's not just ordinary budgies. These are right. shell parakeets. Yeah. So I don't know so much about departures of names uh, going in such a way that they cause some kind of concern or offence. Uh, that might be someone else's as premise. But I think what we do need to do is more of what is happening around the endeavours that Jess is pursuing with so much vigour and passion. And... and cleaning up that sort of stuff as well. And I think there are a bunch of names of Australian birds that we could actually um, start, start proposing some Indigenous names for. And uh, one of my favourites is the Arunda, Central Australian Arunda language group, called zebra finches, ninis. It's N-Y-I-I dash N-Y-I-I, nini, because that's the sound they make, nini. Nini. I love that name, Nini. And I, I would love, I often call them, I've, when I'm out there, I call them Nini. 
So interesting to consider. And then Ricky Coughlin isn't there such an interesting conversation going on in Australia at the moment about Major Mitchell's cockatoo? Oh, yeah. yeah. From, yeah. from the bar, that, that that's what kicked this off, Nick. Nick. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that piece of um, that branding that was on... Uh, uh, that was on Twitter the other day with uh, uh, what? What was the called the Galar Bar or something? Was it or the Galar Hotel with the with the Major Mitchell cockatoo or the pink cockatoo in the artwork? It's like even the most cursory piece of research would would have got that right. But no, someone's done some nice artwork. Well, who cares if we're fucking wrong? You know. well, they won't. Know. You, can, you can just see it. Ah, Looks like a Goliath to me. It's pretty no to one. Goliath. I just use that one. I don't notice much. Spectacular. It's only a bird. <laughs> well, Goliath is one of the few Aboriginal names that persists for that cockatoo. And I think that cockatoo is from a Polynesian word, kakadu, meaning a large parrot. So that's the etymology. And of, of that name, and that goes right back to the 1400s, we've now learned, when there were some manuscripts recently discovered in 2018 that shows a soul for Christ cockatoo. Uh, so obviously there was trading routes happening in Wallacea at least in order to was pick up a soul for Christ cockatoo. Was it a sulfur crested cockatoo or a lesser soul for crested cockatoo? Lesser soul for crested cockatoo. Was it a citron crested cockatoo? Yeah, that's right. You know, so, so what was it? But it's definitely a Wallacean but it's definitely from east of the Wallace line, yeah. which shows that there was activity in that space and somehow birds are making it through that space. And and that Kakadu was the name that came with those crested parrots of limited colour range that don't have dyke texture in their feathers like parrots of the Cetacea they do. So that's that's interesting to consider. But the Major Mitchells thing is a really interesting point. We know that Major Mitchell clearly was not a nice chap. He presided over the massacres of Aboriginal people, but he was also rotten to his own men. And so I was talking with my mate, Matthew Kettle, who heads up the Taronga Zoo free flight show just the other day. We had a lovely, juicy little nugget of conversation about this, and he said that they're definitely calling their pink cockatoos now, pink cockatoos, they're formerly Major Mitchells, calling them pink cockatoos now, and there is a a drive across us all now to to start doing that so interesting isn't it and i think this is this is what we're ushering in is a really interesting dynamic conversation and space headed up by the energies of people like jess who are really getting in there i think there's a great way we can actually start suggesting ways to rename common names of birds in recognition of say for us in australia our first nations people yeah I think too. Yeah. We've got the we've got like the Burke's parrot is is another one that's um, quite common in here. I think that's a case of sucking up that we were talking about earlier. Is that, that you've either got somebody celebrating a um, a colonialist or you've got somebody sucking up to a uh, colonialist. That's right. That's that, right. And then, then that's part. in the Major Mitchell as well, isn't it? Because the scientific yeah. name is. I mean, it used to be Kaka too. I think it's Lofa Crowa now. Um, Led Betteri, who was. A, a, a taxonomic, like a, a specimen dealer, I think, in, in London. And so yeah. it's also been known as Lead Better, Lead Beater's Cockatoo. So yeah. uh, there was a total suck up job as well. And he, mm. yeah, yeah. J just a, a, a parasitic middleman, you know, a, a, the, can, the, a, the antique dealer, basically. <laughs> can I throw a spanner in the works here, though, and say that we, we have our, the, the scientific names, so our proper taxonomic. Uh, terms for, for birds, but um, and they help us understand the relationship of birds. And it, when we see a bird in front of us, we need to know that relationship and understand that in order to to start to grasp the full picture of this bird in its environment and what that means. At least in terms of how we think about things, because most of us don't think about budgerigars as good tucker necessarily. So. How do we name birds in, in the common language or should we name birds in, um, or in terms of their common names in a fashion that does help us understand them? Like um, we keep together our cockatoos or our finches and, and, and birds like this, but um, if we begin to name them with First Nations names, which one do we choose? 
and that, um, how does that help issue. us understand the bird and and keep moving forward with our knowledge and understanding of mm, birds and them to the broader? Mm. That's yeah, right. Yeah. How, how does that keep us? Sorry. That can well let, let let me see if I can guide that from that point on. I reckon that's a really really important point that the relationships between the birds is helped to be understood outside of the scientific, the ornithological or the, you know, the botany community or whatever by using good, appropriate, common names. But the other side is that a good common name is one that if I say it and you understand the 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 words that I'm talking about, that's an acceptable common name. Yes, I picked that up from you the other day. You said yellow-winged honey eater, and yeah. and interestingly, I was guiding a tour just the week before, in which I said to a number of the people there that I didn't really like the name New Holland honey eater, and I I felt that yellow-winged honey eater described it, or even painted honey eater, and that the painted honey eater itself doesn't quite look as painted as the New Holland, which looks like someone's got that brush out and done a very nice job on the breast and belly of the bird. And very paintbrush size strokes. But if you said painted honey eater to me, I would immediately think of the painted honey eater that is in this book. Yes. But when we talk about the yellow winged honey eater, you knew mm. exactly which bird I was talking about. And because of the context it was used, you knew I wasn't talking about the the bunch of birds on the same page in this book that are honey eaters that have that characteristic same yellow wing uh, markings that group them taxonomically together. So, uh, so yellow winged honey eater is a good common name. So is New Holland honey eater. I just don't use New Holland honey eater because it is reflective of that whole colonial mindset, which I'm trying to get away from. Yeah. But, but then, do the Indigenous Australians give a shit? <laughs> do they have a better name that we should be using? That's what always. Uh, well, should, should, I think for it's me. time for us to be allies in this space and lead yeah, the conversation yeah. too. And, and but of course, bringing in Indigenous voices. But I, yeah. I don't. I don't have a problem with with leading that. And we hear in other spaces where you know allies of various groups will also help. You know head the charge and maybe we should be saying hey we just turned up here and imposed this maybe it's for us to fix not them to fix and and the other thing is about the points of time that refer to the the scientific name or the proper name and common names because the way we talked about it early on about when do you correctly ascribe a proper name, a scientific name, that can actually be fi a fixed point in time because of a particular process. <laughs> but common names take hundreds, if not of years, if not longer, because it has to be a widely accepted, commonly used term, or else it's not a common name. Hmm. Well, Willie Wagtail does the job well. Yeah. And I think I, I mentioned that earlier that you know Willie Wagtail is a fantastic name because it so totally describes you know that this bird wags its tail. Though it's not a wagtail in the you know it, the, that we know of, it is a um, it's its own name to describe this this species that everyone immediately recognises in Australia if you say the Willie Wagtail. And I guess it's just been called Willie for I don't know what reason, but it is the Willie Wagtail. It, yeah, it, it's for the same reason bird. that 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 we talk about Brer Rabbit, or you know, it's just that um, alliteration. I think is it, that's I've got that right, haven't I, Nick? That it's um, yeah. It's I love a lilting like, line of I, I love a lilting line of literal alliteration. Just love very, it. Uh, and I think that the the human ear is really into that. And of course, that was always going to catch because what you bestow upon that little pied fantail, which is really what it is, um, at that moment is is character, is relatability. 
within the landscape is is someone you are casting that bird in a certain way and that is actually arguably a really important thing to do for birds because it starts to elevate them from just those ethereal creatures that are out there living these parallel lives to us and brings them more into the human sphere of experience, relatability there. They're suddenly characters. They've got personalities. And that, in conservation terms, is going to be a really important thing for public support of conservation programs. So if it's, I think it's much easier to promote the plight of a willy wagtail over a pied fantail, for instance. So that's a, an important point to consider too. Is that how do you how, how do you capture the imagination? How do you fire and engage public support and make it part of the everyday theater of being in nature? Yeah, that's really important, isn't it? Um, um, I I tried to get someone from New Zealand to join us on this panel because I I love when I look from afar at their birds. Not only do I think they've got some really amazing bird, unique, uh, e- endemic um, taxa, you know, that are quite different, even though they're closely related to ours. But because the Maori languages have survived and Maori culture is, is more intact than most of our indigenous culture here and 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 I'm not trying to say that there isn't indigenous culture here I'm just saying that the Maori names that are attached to to birds commonly in New Zealand is, is quite prevalent because those names are still being used in everyday conversation someone will point to a bird and instead of thinking about should we use the Maori name that's just the the tui, that's just what they have always called it. Um, uh, the kakapo, you know, it it didn't have, uh, I think, they what they tried to call it the owl parakeet or something, but that never caught on. Kakapo just uh, <laughs> kept on. And and it goes on. No one's confused about the the uh, the actual. Uh, evolutionary biological I don't know, I'm probably going to phrase this wrong, but the biological relationships between those individual birds because they're using an indigenous name uh, we, we still know that that big fat pigeon is obviously part of that world of birds because it looks like one uh, I, I just I just wonder how how it makes people love and relate to birds more if the names that are applied make them feel like it's some ownership an affinity of, of, mm. of, of uh, yeah, and and their bird it's like Richard's Pippet you know or even you know, um, the the ground thrush. You know, I don't have a lot of affinity for these kind of names. So, uh, if if there's a if there's an easy to apply and use indigenous name for those uh, species that that garnered common usage, I I'm all for it. I. I'm all for changing the name of the lyrebird, even even though it's a really sensible name. It's one of the few, but only if you have any idea about classical instruments. Right? <laughs> if you don't know what a lyre is, you're going, hang on, you know, it makes as much sense as ficus lirata, which doesn't look anything like a lyre, but it looks like the body of a figgle, Fick, uh, fiddle, but it's called Ficus Lirata. Go figure. <laughs> Who's oh. going to jump in and take that extremely good <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, one of the things that, like, when I look at the names that of the bird, the bird names, I just really love. It's it's the ones that do have character, or they bring to life some element of the natural history of that bird. And so, you know, I'm. I, I was saying before we went on air, like, I love hummingbird names. Um, they're just, you know, they tend to be just particularly the ones in. Central and South America, they're just so over the top. It's like, oh, this this is a little orange hummingbird. You know what? We'll call that the shining sunbeam. And it's like, all right, we'll go for it. Like I can I can get behind a bird called the shining sunbeam or like the the, you know, the mountain nymph or the uh, mountain gem or, you know, all these wonderful names. And so I love those. I love ones that use over the top adjective adjectives as well. So like um the superb starling or the um uh uh charming hummingbird or lovely katinga like i i love that too because it's like i want to i want to i want to know more about that bird that sounds that pre- sounds pretty sweet and then yeah, yeah the ones katinga, that have some sorry katinga oh. do you know if that is a, an indigenous word or is that a spanish de, um bastardization or ha- i would have, have to look other... i would have to look that up i think it's an automatic peak one which means that it could indeed be like you know originally indigenous in origin but i don't know off the top of my head there's definitely more of those in south central and south america than north america like there's the sapayoa and the watson and you know a lot you know uh uh a lot more there um but uh, um, I don't know on that on the particular etymology on that. I should, but I I don't. Ricky, there's a lot of the... random facts shoved in my head that just doesn't happen to be one of them. Um, I think you're doing pretty spectacularly well, <laughs> Jess. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think you're doing amazingly well. And I just want to say, Jess, what about the puff leg? That's another cool name for a hummingbird, right? Oh, I love that. It's puff so. Leg. It's like yes. <laughs> Yeah, He's got little, puff little fluffy trousers. Yeah. You, okay, we're going to call that yeah. a puff leg. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there's just yeah, there's just so many wonderful names for all of them. I just I love them, but yeah, and then like in terms, but in terms of like the practicalities of like when I sat down with folks and like we're gonna put in a proposal on how to, on changing a name or whatever, which. In um, in terms of like officially changing names and North common names in North America right now, we're kind of at a little bit of an impasse because we tried to put in a whole bunch of proposals when this got started, and when Bird Names for Birds started gaining momentum, and there was a huge fight in our ornithological society, and they've kind of put a moratorium on changing common names due to um, you know the reasons we brought up. So right now we're kind of focusing more on well the common name is what people use. So if everybody just starts calling this, you know, a desert Oriole, then it's now a desert Oriole and now just, and they've got no leg to stand on. So um, that's, that's kind of where we've been focusing, but right. you know, when, we, when we, yeah. <laughs> and like, and, and, you know, I think one of the coolest things has been like, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm also on, on the academic side of things, although a lot of the people involved in, bird names for birds are more on like the birding and uh natural history side of things but it's been really cool to go to conferences and see papers in the past couple years where there are people who have been quite receptive um you know there's uh there's a couple of groups now uh research groups now that will go and like they study an organism that they study a bird that has an eponymous name and not only will they not use the common name in the paper or in a conference presentation but they'll even like make a note of it. Like we're no longer using the common name because you know, one of them is the Townsend's warbler. And it's like, we're not using this because uh, John Kirk Townsend was kind of a piece of trash. Um, so, you know, um, uh, so I, I think, I think a lot of the, we're, we've been focusing on that for the moment uh, uh, in terms of actually making change. But when we've sat down and we've talked about like, well, what are good ideas for names? Like a lot of times what comes up are like these habitat or natural history associations. Um, and I think those are really, I think those can be really powerful, um, you know, alternatives, um, you know, 
for especially when we're talking about birds that like I think it'd be really awesome to work with indigenous nations to, you know, if they're comfortable with doing so, getting those names to be used. But, you know, also when you're talking about birds that range across North America, hundreds and hundreds of different language groups, um, it is also still helpful to have a single English name to be like, you know, hey, so, um, you know, but a lot of what we've all we've focused on have been these like, uh, you know, calling calling things like uh either by names they used to be called like the uh uh kirtland's warbler um was until relatively recently like in the past century it was routinely called the jack jack pine warbler by people who actually lived in their uh small breeding range in michigan um and it was named for its habitat association and there's been a lot of movement there's starting to be more movement on starting to call it that now and i think that's i i I, I think that those are the types of names that get people to care more about birds too, just because it's like it it ties a, it ties the landscape that they're living in together. And um, you know, and I think I think one thing that we've been trying to do at Bird Names for Birds um uh is try to bring in people who aren't just in the academic realm. Cause, you know, people like me, we've got a certain bias in how we think about birds and how we want to call birds because it's like, well, you know, we got to stick with like the classification of like this or whatever. Whereas people who, you know, are just casual birders. Like I think people like my parents, like my dad who grew up on a farm in Colorado. And like, I remember the first time going birding with him, uh, uh, I got into birds later in life. So we were, you know, I was visiting them and we were in Colorado visiting family and he was like, oh yeah, that's a bee, Martin. It's a Western kingbird. I would never think to call it that. But like, I, I think there's, and, but like, he was calling it that because, and it was a commonly used name where he grew up because of the behavior and watching them up on the telephone lines like Martins, um, even though they're not even vaguely closer related and, you know, hunting bees and it's like, and other flying insects. And I'm like, you know, is it taxonomically like quote unquote a good common name? Not really, but is it a good one in terms of describing that bird to the people who, you know, see them every day, even if they're not serious ornithologists? Like, yeah. And I, I that that's one thing I do want to see more of in and have been pushing for in the more academic spaces I'm in of like, we should be bringing in, you know, the birders and like the kind of casual nature appreciators too, because, you know, it's what... It, it's it's kind of once, once you start pulling on the thread of like, well, why do we name birds after people? It kind of very quickly becomes like, well, why should I, why do I have a say over what that bird's called anyways? Mm. Just kind of very quickly becomes, well, just put it all to the people. <laughs> um, yeah. Bird nerds are people too, right? So, um, you know, it's not not a, it's not only the ivory towers that that need consideration. In in the time that we've got left, let's um, uh, let let's have a little bit of fun while being a bit serious as well. Um, what? Start with you, Nick, and then then Ricky, and then Jess. Let's have a suggestion for a, a bird name that you think is bad, wrong, slash inappropriate, or that you just downright hate? Wow. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start the ball rolling because I was thinking about this this morning. I hate the Australian magpie name. I would much rather that we were calling it a piping crow shrike than a magpie. Just simply because if you go to most um, cheap bookshops and get a book that has birds in it and look up a magpie, it's probably a bird that doesn't look like the Australian magpie. Whereas the piping sh crow shrike gives, you, uh, gives us a nod to its vocal ability and also some of the things that it does. It's a classically good murder bird. Now, Nick, 
have another go while you're looking through your bird book. I can just see what you're doing. You're like, no, I don't hate that one. No, no there are I so many that, that I. There, there are mostly <laughs> bird names that I just love. Well, we're, I mean, we're gonna I, do we're gonna do the good ones in a minute, but but tell, uh, surely, I think surely you the princess parrot. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. <laughs> but it, it is, but it's bloody stupid, isn't it? Which princess? For crying out loud, Princess Alexandra. Yeah, but we why isn't have it a princess whole Alexandra? Um, our, our other. Um, a uh, historical biographies co-lead Alex Holt actually did a article on our web on our website that's going through all of the birds that are named like King so and so's bird or Princess whatever King of and Saxony like, Paradise Bird yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, like yeah. who are these random people like what is it with naming birds for royalty I mean obviously it's <laughs> sucking up but like looking at it and so um and it was where it was even is Saxony. <laughs> if we don't know where it is, who do we care that the bloody king, right? So, um. uh, you know, one of the bird names that I I think is uh, rather charming as an alternative name for the yellow wattle bird. It was its name, common name in early colonial days in Tasmania was vomit bird. The vomit bird. I can get on. Mm. I can get on with that. But what? <laughs> Why aren't because we calling of its owls call. vomit birds? I mean, really? <laughs> um, because they're not making the, the vomit hate. sound. I mean, the, the wattle bird, yeah. the yellow wattle bird, actually makes sound like someone puking up. I wish, so, I, wish that, I knew that earlier because I would have grabbed the sound <laughs> clip and we could play that. Um, well, it's like... Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the red wattle bird and even the little bird, the little wattle bird... Uh, sort of sound like they're choking on their chicken bones too. Um, they do. <laughs> they do. I mean, uh, yeah. Ricky, Ricky, and I have had lots of fun trying to um, imitate, kind of work out what exactly it is about wattle bird sounds um, that that makes them so so bizarrely sort of gratingly charming. <laughs> and, I remember well, it's the Clarkson, isn't it? It's Clarkson like horn, yeah. it's, it's like a, a, a T model four uh, convention when they turn. Uh, uh, Remember the fryer birds too, <laughs> and they're all come on. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and 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 what and what are birds? Inquiring time. <laughs> what are birds act like they sound as well? I reckon when you the 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 way they're kind of gronky, clumsy, but also exquisite in their own way. The way they flit around the outside of a tree, um, they're amazing. Yeah. But Ricky, one that you hate. Have you got one? I don't know if it's hate, but it's kind of, it always grates. And that is minor and minor. And that we have the M Y N A H, we have the M I N E R. And as if there's not enough confusion already between these two birds, we <laughs> have, the, have a name that's, yeah, you know, one that's spelt ridiculously and one that's spelt that sounds like, well, how is this bird a minor? And um, as in, you know, as in coal miner, not minor, not very young um, or smaller, um, it's just the minor. It, it just seems very ridiculous. Like we, minor is the established name, obviously, for, for a greater period of time for the, for say, the, the common or Indian minor um, with the M-Y-N-A-H spelling. But we've got this minor, M-I-N-E-R thing that came along. What were we saying? And of course, we've got so we've got the bell and the minor and the yellow thread and a number of these birds. My, what is my, that? My theory is that the the colonial minor has been to the the local word for the bird we know as and the group of birds that we know as miners, the Indian minor, the common minor. And I reckon that's been anglicised and that they've just written down M-Y-N-A or M-Y-N-A-H. And then as, as people who have probably w been in a colonial outpost have come to Australia, have then gone, oh, it's got a bit of yellow or it's a, it's a bit like... <laughs> 
it's a bit like the minor, but of course they didn't know what the spelling was. They've gone minor and called it an M I N E R. And of course now we've got the, the brilliant confusion of some people. I mean, in my first, first seen and heard hashtag each morning, I get people saying, I, I saw some minors, M-I-N-O-Rs. So we've mm-hmm. got naughty children as well hanging out. Uh, <laughs> but but again, if someone's minor and they spell it wrong or or they say an Indian minor, no matter what the spelling is, we know what the bird is in in this part of the uh, in this part of the country. Um, so I'm a little bit unless you're unless you're in Melbourne that. where you've got minors and minors. Yeah, but if someone says a noisy miner, I know which bird they're talking about. Yeah, and you know, the only say, thing that's accurate about that bird is its name, Noisy, because it's certainly yeah. noisy, and it's certainly <laughs> not minor. It's like the noisy major, because it's like it's just so in your face the whole time, everything that it does. I mean, it's such a fascinating species, amazing. But oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of think of it more as a noisy major rather than a noisy minor. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, all right, let, let, Let's go round. Well, actually, Jess, we hadn't we hadn't got to you. What? Yeah, it, come I on, think Jess. is there the a one, most objectionable one? Um, there's. I mean, there's so many to choose from, but the the one that just kind of particularly bugs me is Franklin's gall, um, <laughs> which is this beautiful, lovely, um, <laughs> small gall with a black head that lives throughout the prairies of North America. And they named it after the guy who got more people killed trying to find the freaking Northwest Passage and then trying to go find him when he didn't come back and then just making, you know, just doing so much, just like, no, like, why does, what did this goal do to be saddled with this guy's name, this, this joker? Um, I, I really, I, I feel like the prairie gall would be a good name for it because it, it just, it loves that that Great Plains belt. And I would actually, there's another gall that's very closely related, the Bonaparte's gall, which is named for some relative of Napoleon's um, who decided not to be a conqueror, but to go be a naturalist. And was kind of a colorful guy, but, um, and not necessarily somebody that seems to have been particularly objectionable, but just in the spirit of, uh, you know, why are we naming these for people anyways? Um, I feel like that one should be like the tundra gall or the boreal gall. There's a lot of Bonaparte. There's a lot of Bonaparte plants, and I think, uh, I think that guy. Uh, I, I should, I would have looked it up if I knew we were going to talk about it. I think he was on one of the um, uh, Spice Islands kind of ex- expeditions, and why so many. Um, East Asian Asian plants and Northern Australian plants have have his name applied. Um, I didn't know. I didn't actually know he was a relative of Napoleon. I just thought. He I was. mean, that's how he. That's he. He traveled all over the place. He uh, and I think he was in the Caribbean too. And like that was okay. that was how he financed it. He was just like, I'm I'm rich. I'm gonna go look at some plants and some birds. And I'm like, I mean, there's worse ways to spend your money when you're related to. That, you know, that, well, guy who well, conquered well, that, most that, of Europe. <laughs> well, that was, uh, I mean, in the in the time, it's the equivalent yeah. of owning a football team or 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 a Formula One team. You know, it yeah. was people of that kind of wealth and that kind of um, social cachet who were funding mm-hmm. all these uh, uh, all these expeditions if they weren't actually the king or the queen or or whatever. Um, all right, let let. let Let's let's talk about the good ones. Some of the one, some of the ones we really, really, really like. Um, Nick, you can kick that one off. I, as far as scientific names are concerned, I absolutely love the name of the Luzon bleeding heart pigeon. Uh, it's Gala Colomba Luzonica, and that's because it reminds me. It, I just think of an opera diva strutting out onto the stage with that name, you know. <laughs> Would you now please welcome to the concert stage of the Royal Opera House, Gala Colomba Luzonica. <laughs> it just yeah. was always appealed to me as being a fantastically, fabulously opulent, extravagant name. 
Uh, Nick, but I'm I... glad you mentioned that one. <laughs> I'll just butt in because it's relevant. Uh, next year, when I finally get back to the Philippines, one of the aims of my next Philippines trip is to go and find, if I can, every bleeding heart pigeon. So yep, they're spectacular yeah. birds. I've, I've had them, you know, looked after them in my career as an aviculturist, and they they're a wonderful little pigeon. Uh, I am up there definitely with Jess on on hummingbird names. They're just the best. Um, but I also have um, a, a real interest in naughty bird names like um, blue-footed booby and, <laughs> uh, and 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 cock of the rock and, and all those those sorts of things. And I actually have this fabulous T-shirt, which is is covered in in tits, various tit species, yeah, and across the top it says "nice tits." And I and I love that. I love that, that sort of beauty, that, that playfulness. Yeah. yeah, and um, so I love things like that. But yeah. anything that is that is musical and and beautiful in a bird's name like the euphonia for instance i just love those sorts of names and anything that that has a, a, a superb lyricism will often get me involved as well i saw one at a t-shirt recently nick that you would like um here one two uh great tits it just had great tits and a one and two. So I thought that was that was very funny. Yeah, they're just um, they're just just great fun, you know. Just I love that stuff. And and who can look past the evergreen woodcock? <laughs> Excuse me. I I've often wondered about how that name was applied. Was it someone just taking the piss, or is it is it because in the woods, you might find this bird, or yeah. was it just someone uh, who was uh, upset that um, that 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 the cod piece was going out of fashion? So let's <laughs> so let's call the bird a woodcock. You know? oh, oh, I love it. But the, I think Caper Cayley is also a really great great That's bird. Name. It's beautiful. You know, there's so there, there are so many, and and you're talking about New Zealand birds. In Australia, the cousin of the grey fantail is the, the, the. No, in Australia, the grey fantail is the grey fantail, but in New Zealand, it's the piwaka waka, which I think is fantastic. And Just let, love that. And 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 let's argue over it's whether it's a different species or not. Hey, I mean, so I, so similar, <laughs> but you know, I just love the fact that it's not the New Zealand fantail or something like that. It's it's actually the piwaka waka. Yeah, I mean the New Zealand names. Actually, we, we've got to do another one where I just get some some uh, New Zealanders on to to, to talk about uh, to talk about that. Ricky, what's what's the name or two that you really like and that you think is really appropriate? Well, I love um, Jerigany, mm -hmm. and one because it, it can be kind of playful because people they come from abroad and they'll come on one of my tours. And it will inevitably be called the Jerry Gone. Yeah, what, but of course, what's that Jerry Gone? Oh, um, I can <laughs> never forget um, um, some New Yorkers who came on a um, birding tour with me, and the, the gentleman loudly proclaimed, "Look, Nancy, a Jerry Gone." And it was just the way with the. I can't do the accent, but when this loud accent. Um, uh, came out. It's just it's stuck in my memory forever. But of I would, course, you know, I would just like to say thank you because I also have only ever read that bird name, and so <laughs> you just saved me um, embarrassment. Yes, yes, <laughs> you have been spared. <laughs> well, I love too that it means born of sound or born of song, and there oh. are some beautiful Jerigony calls out there those descending what they call the falling leaf note those descending notes which is it's just stunning and these these birds are often just fall into the category of the little brown bird or the difficult bird but they have these charming songs and usually they're in numbers that fill, fill a forest or a mangrove forest or wherever they are and there's one called um locally the lazy jack which is the mangrove jerigony because it leaves one of the notes out so if I can get into my bird calls, it usually goes like um, you've got your um, many jerigonies will have something that sounds like and it goes and it, it just leaves notes out. So it's called the lazy jack. 
Um, so I, I really love that. But in terms of, um, so it's descriptive in a way that we don't understand, I guess, because we don't all have the Greek language to inform us of that, which brings me to the spotted partalote or the partalotes. And, of course, spotted like a leopard, as in the leopard and partalote, and that we've, we've brought that name into the, the, the common English usage as well so it's it's a it's a part of load and that there's a reckon this is spotted like a leopard and though most people don't know that that's what it is and they call this bird this funny name or this odd sounding name that it's actually that very descriptive term and it's descriptive in a beautiful way to talk about um uh that it's spotted like a leopard and i know nick and i have had a conversation or two about this in the past and um it's it's one of those names that just celebrate some other beautiful things in the world of nature that's just just very touching so they're they're my my two names that i particularly love and that stand out for me whenever anybody asks me about bird names and the the that call you just did reminds me also of uh, another fabulous australian bird name the chiming wedge bill yeah and and its call is But if you head a little bit further to the east, is it is it Ricky? You get the chirruping wedge. The chirruping wedge. Yes. And I want to know is that there are okay, one's chiming and one's chirruping, and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> Who decided what was chiming and which was chirruping? And, and, <laughs> and, and of course I'll have to put the Xenocanto calls of everything uh, that have been noted on the web page. So for those of you doing doing the replay. Come to the birdemergency.com slash whichever page I've given this, and I'll put the calls on there so that you can enjoy them. Jess, yeah, I mean, it's for you. I think, I mean, I really love our night jars here in North America because we've got the we've got the whippoorwill, we've got the chuckswills widow, and we've got the poor well that all are just these fabulous automatopoeic names. Um, and um, I grew up in Whippoorwill country, so that's just like the sound of a summer evening to me. And um, I, I, I miss hearing them. But um, I part of me kind of wishes that all of the night hawks and night jars got that name. But like then the common night hawk would be the common tree, um, which isn't nearly as melodic. Um, but and then like I think my I, I like I said I my I mean love of hummingbird names knows no bounds but in terms of scientific names like the one that i love the most is the common eider somateria mollissima because mollissima is latin for like the softest and fluffiest oh, and nice. i love that so much <laughs> um it, it's just and like having having worked in alaska and having had the privilege to prep some eiders as museum skins they are indeed the softest and the fluffiest well i've got a couple jess for you my my northern hemisphere or north american ones <laughs> uh, i love i love the prothonotary warbler and the story behind that uh and the color uh, mm -hmm. i don't really know the bird but i love the name the dick thistle that and 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 that it's not spelt as we would think the dick thistle it's actually different but the sticks in your in your mind especially if your only uh reference point is the scottish uh thistle flower that we that we all know from shortbread biscuits and and things like that tins so I will say, having having taught undergrad ornithology in Oklahoma, where dick thistles are very common, um, and they are lovely birds, um, but uh, it is uh, that is that is also the crowd crowd favorite name, hands down. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I I was just stunned when I first heard it. I thought, how did that pass muster? But then again, and. And uh, there's two more I, I really love in North America common usage. Um, I love the loon, of course, and that's uh, would would you it, 
it's not really strictly correct to say it's an onomatopoeic name, is it? But it, but it is because of the uh, the call. And of yeah. course, who could who could leave out the Roadrunner? Uh, I I think that's a, a, a although it. I wonder whether it got its name before Rhodes. Um, I just don't, don't know. know on that but, one. It's a, but it's a cool name, and it's the most loony looking bird. Uh, if you get to see the lots of videos, there's been one they recently are doing the rounds wonderful. of, of yeah, the 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 nest the someone that nesting under someone's uh, boat trailer or something, which a, which was a beauty. But in Australia, Wampu pigeon, again, automatic peeing, um, booble cow, uh, but perhaps the best one. Frogmouth, the tawny frogmouth. I think that is one of the most apt and fitting names for anyone who's ever seen one. And even if you just see a picture without the mouth open, you kind of think, oh, yeah, it's kind of, that's a weird name for a weird bird. So that's good. I- when when I when I helped teach ornithology as a PhD student, we we took the students to the um, Oklahoma City Zoo, which actually has a pretty good bird um, uh, bird section, and they have they have frogmouths, I believe tawny tawny frogmouths. But there was one student that just stood there for like five minutes, utterly transfixed, and she was she was just like, "It's a muppet." <laughs> That's it. That's exactly it wants to kill me. Like. She's like, it wants, I think it wants to kill me, but it's a Muppet. <laughs> Nick, they you are. remember being in North Australia and mm. seeing where Bergman's rule plays out and these Muppets mm. that they start out down south quite large. Up north, they were so tiny. Remember yeah. we were in that campground and we yeah, saw they these were, tiny frog mouths. They were, they were practically out at night, Charles. It was amazing to see. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 really interesting. And I think yes, they are bizarre, but really, as far as Capromolga forms are concerned, the Nictibidae <laughs> definitely has to have the market cornered on utter weirdness. Do you know the 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 potus of central of South and Central America? Oh, I, like it's like this humongous Marty Feldman eyes, this bizarre face. You can that, barely that don't work have out to coordinate. Going. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the weirdest. They can thing. independently dilate their pupils and point them <laughs> like, in different directions. Like they are amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they're, yeah. They're, they're freaky. Well, uh, I I'm going to invite people to leave comments on the web page or on the the YouTube video, or whatever. If you would like to uh, tell us your favourite um, bird names or your least favourite, your the ones that. Uh, get stuck in your craw or anything like that. And also, let us know. I reckon we should assemble this august panel again and <laughs> maybe talk a little bit more about some of the fringe issues of bird names. And I'd really like to, Nick, perhaps um, do a bit more of a historical dive for some of them and maybe some of the family groups. And uh, I, I generally talked about the... Wallachia when we did the episode on uh, on pitters with David Tan. Uh, oh, yeah. But I reckon talking about the significance of some of the guys. Look, we didn't even talk about John Gilbert. I didn't even get get into Gilbert, but yeah. we can probably Well, I think you about... save him for next time because he was an amazing, <laughs> amazing human animal, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. There, there's just so many interesting stories about bird names that can lead us down some really useful paths, I think. So uh, even, Ricky, you mentioned the Burke parrot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I think people are moving away from that name. Um, So that gives us an opportunity to choose an appropriate name and sunset parrot's been thrown around a bit. But... Mm -hmm. But that one doesn't really, I mean, for me, I find that not a really easy one to, to, um, easy. Uh, yeah. It's, I, I, it's easy, man. And, it's the pastel party parrot. Well, <laughs> isn't I, it? I, it's got that beautiful light blue 
that mm. beautiful light purple and light pink. It reminds me, it's, it's like it just that bird just passed through the 80s and that's yep. what the 80s presented. <laughs> <laughs> All those pastels. And, and when, Can I just give I a shout a out kid. to the two other bird names that I love that I just forgot off the top of my head. Uh, the beautiful tree runner, which is a subossine passerine from uh, Central and South America, um, they're they're wonderful. Um, and then, uh, not that it's particularly flattering to the bird, but I love the intermediate egret. He's doing his <laughs> best. Yeah. 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 Imagine being assigned for all time to intermediate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, oh, Are you great? Oh my. No. Are you little? Yeah. No, yeah. I'm just yeah. intermediate. <laughs> it, 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 I'm rich. It, it, it's like the the almost good enough or yeah. the, the the middle child. The hello, mediocre. That, hello, uh, hello. <laughs> yes, that's just the middle child. Um, and it, and look, Australian Australian bird nerds, um, please forgive us for leaving out the whip bird. That mm. that's probably the most appropriately named common name in the country i think um yeah i think uh, i think we've got right through that now jess if people want to i mean can people contribute to bird names for birds tell us how yeah i mean we have um we have some ways to get involved on our website uh bird names for birds uh dot wordpress dot com uh, bird names for birds on all the socials. Um, I think that our Twitter handle has the the number four instead of four spelled out. But um, uh, and then um, I've got a link. I've got a link. Oh, good. Bird names yeah. For birds, so, so and so, yeah, and yeah. so we we we've got we've got all sorts. We got different ways to be involved. Links to other groups that we um, support and are in conversation with, and. Um, as well as kind of some ongoing work on writing up historical bios for the people behind the eponyms. Um, and that includes uh, not just North American birds, because um, like I said, our the other historical uh, bio uh, lead is based out of the UK and has uh, different interests in get, digging into some of the other birds, uh, yeah. uh, bird names as well. So... Um, I've but linked, yeah, I've linked to your list of articles. Awesome, but um, yeah, uh, but that that uh, that gives me an idea for a name for the the people behind the 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 eponymous names. That should just be called the Bastard Book, right? Or the inappropriate uh, eponymous names. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, links links to um to to the reference. Uh, yeah, and then I and and then for my social personally, JF McLaughlin nine two on Twitter, and I post about this and other issues more broadly focused on uh, justice and equity in science, um, as well as lots of pictures of my dogs. So what what's not to love? And of course, we've we, we've met the dog uh, or, or one of the dogs <laughs> today. So yeah, I've got the I've got the Jess links over to you, Nick. What do you? The, 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 this is the shameless shill plugging section. What would you like? To... <laughs> you know, I don't have nearly as many uh, endeavours as Jess does, and I'm going to be very keen to go into those resources and spend some time in that place. But I mean, I work out of Zoo South Australia, and I'm often on our media as well there we run Adelaide Zoo in the city an eight hectare property which has been there for 140 years but we also have a humongous safari park 1600 hectares up in the Murray lands of South Australia where incidentally you can see many fabulous Mallee birds so I'm often on the socials for Zoo South Australia and I've been having a good tinker this year with a couple of endeavors which I hope to launch in the new year so it's a question of stay tuned all right, we'll keep, <laughs> keep us informed. Um, now, Nicholas, you just reminded me uh, the the blue and gold macaw is safely back in the in the zoo. Um, that 
got out a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, Manu, but, but, yes. Yes, but w- was it you guys who lost the Red Panda? That wasn't me. I love it. Lost a Red Panda. It's like, oh, has anyone seen my Red Panda? <laughs> It was here a moment ago. <laughs> I can't remember which, which zoo it got out of in the last week or two. Can you remember Adelaide that, zoo. Ricky? That was Adelaide in the zoo. news. Yeah, it was in Adelaide. It was zoo. Adelaide. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. it, so it was you guys again. Okay. Yeah. What's was going on with pain. your security there at Adelaide Zoo? Oh, let's just say it's up to our fabulous enrichment imagination. <laughs> so this so, was a new animal, a new animal in his home, his home area. And... It had been a particularly wet and windy night, and we think that some of the bamboo uh, adjacent to his home area might have sort of blown his direction, and he just went, he grabbed it oh, and good. got pulled into went the bamboo over, and then the decided he was going to go and have an explore. I, I, I can just imagine that there's some twitches in the parklands going, uh, darling, darling, <laughs> over here. Uh, is... Is that a, a bandicoot? What, what, what is that? You know, That's the weirdest um, possum I've ever seen. Diurnal as well. But and 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 I'm imagining those uh, those American tourists on their on their Australian birding trip of a lifetime when when your uh, uh, blue and gold macaw was out and they and they're sitting there with their blue going no. I, no, I'm, yeah, I don't think it can be any of these, darling. <laughs> it was, it, he was seen out in Rymore Park having a drink from a local pond. That's a fair, yeah. fair way away from the zoo, up over the Botanic Gardens, not far from a quarter ago. But he was having a drink from this famous pond, and a nurse who was walking home from a shift at the Royal Adelaide Hospital saw that bird and thought, Oh, I've never seen one of those before. <laughs> so, <laughs> clearly not ornithologically <laughs> minded. Um, but when she heard on the radio that we were looking for this bird and described it, that's when yeah. that's when she gave us a clue. We went up to that area to look for it. But I put everybody on alert in the district, and we finally found him far, a fair bit north of that spot, right across over the zoo and into the northern suburbs in a spot called Prospect. Uh, and by the time we caught up with him, it had been he'd been out for two nights. And uh, he was really keen to, to get uh, back see home. us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the I, first thing I did was give him some grapes to hydrate him straight up and then some peanuts for a little bit of protein. But he just, as soon as he got him back to his home space, he just sat there and went he, off to sleep. He was a happy bird. I, I, I've, li- I've linked to your media releases at, at the time in the episode, in Chad's <laughs> episode. So <laughs> the bird Did Chad also com. tell you about the sooty owl as well? Uh I can't remember. Tell yeah, us yeah. about we, that story. Well, we had a sort of... Oh, oh hang on. Is that the one that yeah. flew away from the bird, from the flight show? Yeah, and, and yeah. we found him eventually in the grounds of the university, which, given the lyrical and legendary reputation of that particular clan of birds, I thought was rather fitting. <laughs> and, uh, cool. and I sent Chad up, the tree being the smaller and lighter of the two of us, I sent Chad up to get that bird. <laughs> And it was it was absolutely fascinating. It was it was an amazing adventure? But uh, yeah, that that hour was eventually recovered in the university. I'll I'll hunt down if there's a media release for for that episode. I'll hunt down. Uh, oh yeah, it, it'll be there. Paid. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll also put that on the uh, on the Chad page. So that's thebirdemergency dot com slash Chad, uh, which and you can get to know Chad. Um, so. Yeah, and Ricky, what are, what, are you still taking enrolments in the uh, in the bird watching course, or is it all tours at the moment? Well, um, it you know it is turning more and more into courses because people tend to want to get want to engage in this way with um, with birds and birding and with other birders. Um, I've got another one starting on September 5. I've got one place left open for that, that I could squeeze someone in. If it's a couple turn up, well, then, you know, we'll do. Um, I'm, go- I'm moving from, this was originally going to be a once a year thing. Uh, next year, it's going to be four times a year. So every three months, I'm going to kick one of these bird watching for beginner courses off because they've proven to be so popular. 
There's also the ever popular um, Little Brown Birds uh, workshop, mm. which is a day long workshop, which uh, in which we attempt to um, uh, help people overcome their confusion, like uh, over little brown birds. And I, I think that everyone can relate. Uh, so we go into that. And a lot of that, of course, is um, how you look at a bird. And for all of us who are involved with birds, we all know that as soon as someone knows that you, you have any involvement with a bird, they will start describing a bird to you in a way which you have no chance of understanding what that it's is. about this and, big. And, oh, and it was a yellow and a black. And, and yeah, and it, it comes down to people generally who aren't familiar with bird watching and birds don't know how to look at a bird and describe a bird. If you don't know how to look at it, you won't know how to describe it properly. So we have to work through all of these layers of our experience of the bird. And of course, then all the skills, the binocular skills and the field craft and how to walk a trail, how to use a trail, how to be ready to get that bird in one moment. And maybe out of three or four very brief partial views of a bird, work out what that bird's going to be. And um, that you know, so learning those couple of features that go with each bird. And, of course, then there's behaviour. So if we understand behaviour of birds, that's often a clue to not only where and when to find them um, and, and where or when you will not find them, but also what you're seeing from a distance and sometimes even before jizz comes into play where it's simply the behaviour. So, so, like we can all recognise from quite a distance if we're going to be looking at a yellow robin, for instance, on a trail. So they'll be clinging to a, a, a branch or, a, or a, a, a small trunk and then they, they have this plunging um, sort of you know, uh, dive onto the trail to, to grab their prey. And it, it is just unmistakable when you see it. Or um, other things that are unmistakable is um, a, a eastern spinebill, just the sound of its wings as it flies by. And these kind of small hints that, um, that you can often get that help you to put birds together or your experience of birds. So there's a lot of information that can go into the day-long courses but also these courses that go over six months. So the, wow. the bird watching course is a six-month long course of um, six field trips, six Zoom sessions, um, five assignments that you get to do and six or seven um, uh, e-books as well. So it's quite a complete oh course. Yeah, yeah. So everyone gets lots homework, of homework. homework. But the homework's fun. And there's there's lots of, you work through the e-book and there's all things there's little hints on, you know, sharpen your skills on this or work on your skills, these kind of things. And uh, it's all about ultimately getting people to look at birds. And so that's a big thing. Then there's you know outback tag along tours which I'm setting up as well for next year and those kind of things. So more broadly birding around out back New South Wales. So they're going to be a lot of uh, fun. Well, so, well, yeah, always a lot of adventures when you start to, I guess, wade into um, helping people um, interact with birds, as we all do in our different ways. Yeah, we've had well, so many great adventures. Of Ricky and I, I can actually really vouch for the fun of being in the field with Ricky. It's, it's absolutely superb. Well, we've had okay, lots of great I'm, birding moments. Well, he said. The, 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 standard, the, the standard thing. Um, and under, uh, either in the show notes or on the page, there's a note, uh, a link for Ricky's um, uh, site. Uh, Jess, you look like you need to get into bed. It's pretty late there. So, oh, yeah. so, my, <laughs> so I've only got one thing to shill because, of course, the pandemic's over and everything's back to normal, right? Except if you're a podcaster. So thebirdemergency.com slash coffee. Go and buy me a coffee. That would be much appreciated. Uh, that's the only shameless plug I want to <laughs> give. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for joining us from Adelaide Zooland. Ricky Coglin from, oh, what, the, the southern suburbs of... Uh, the of, Shire. The, of, oh, the, oh, the, the Shire. The Shire. <laughs> oh, uh, Jess, we're all laughing because the Shire is where our former PM that we luckily kicked to the curb, who recently we found out 
was not only the Prime Minister, but the Secret Minister in five other ministerial portfolios that he forgot to tell his other ministers that he was doing. So we were lucky with Dodson Bullet. We kicked him out. He's retired to the Shire, and Ricky's probably going to see him uh, heading down the milk bar or something like that. Uh, and Jess McLaughlin, bird names for birds from UC... UCB, I want to say UCLA, but at UC Berkeley in California, IA, uh, Bird Names <laughs> for Birds, all the links under the show. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. This has been the Bird Emergency. Let's do this again soon. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. Been great. I've had a ball. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>